Okay, hello, Ling201. Uh, welcome to uh, the first episode, I guess, of Ling201 practice exercises. I'm coming to you from my basement, to which I've been relegated uh, because it's cold out on the front porch. Uh, yeah, sure, we'll go with that story. Anyways, uh, what I want to do for today is uh, walk you through some of the answers to the first set of uh, practice exercises, or what I call in-class exercises here on the homepage, because in another world in the before time we used to actually do these in class together um, so i'm going to walk through the first morphology practice exercise uh, you might notice if you follow the link on the home page that i've got the key for the exercises posted here um, so uh, this is what the practice exercises look like we walk through these together during the synchronous um, zoom session with class on friday um, only about a third of the class shows up to those so which is still a fair number of people and i'm glad you guys do um, but if you weren't there, this is for you. Uh, and those people who were there on Friday did not really have much of an issue with the free and bound morphemes exercises. So we'll focus for now on just the word trees on uh, this set of 10. Um, and for these, I want to point out something that I have for you on the link to a one homepage here. So if you follow the links, um, it there's a link here at the bottom for tree drawing software. There's actually three. So uh, this is something I first used uh, in spring of this year during the end of the winter semester <clears throat> when we first had to go online and learn how to do this all digitally. So I think the best one of these is, or the easiest one to use is called uh, JS Syntax Tree, like JS is JavaScript. Um, so it looks like this, and we'll use this again when we get into syntax towards the uh, second half of the semester. But I'm going to use this um, to kind of give you the answers for the um, morphology trees that we're going to draw today, just so you see how this operates and so we can like play around with different options pretty quickly. Give me a second. Um, yeah, I also have the key for this up online as well. Uh, so if you follow this link here, you will see how I have drawn these trees out in um, Microsoft Word form. They look like this. I'm just gonna recreate most of these um, as we walk through them to kind of address uh, different issues that came up when we were talking about these in class. So with no further ado, um, yeah, I've got this up here as well. With no further ado, why don't we look at the first one, which is Shipper. And shipper, uh, so overall shipper is a noun. So I'll lay it out like this. And we've got the root being ship and the affix at the end being er. <clears throat> so a shipper is one who ships. So a couple questions came up with this one. Uh, one is exactly how to spell the word ship here. So I've spelled it like it looks in its root form, which is just a, just a verb by itself. You can ship something. Um, if you spell it out, um, when you add the affix to it, in English spelling notation, you add another P there to guarantee that this I uh, vowel is pronounced as like the short I. So it's I, not I. So if it was just like this it might be shiper if you you know wrote that out without the two p's um this makes it an i there that's just kind of how one part of the weirdness of how english spelling works <clears throat> the pronunciation of a vowel depends on like the letters that follow it um i'm not going to do that when i write out these trees and i would recommend that you not do that just so you can see the kind of root um words and morphemes a little more easily or clearly. Uh, so just, I'd say, I recommend running it out like that. And, you know, we can figure it out um, after the fact uh, how it ought to be spelled if you put it together. Uh, that being said, I'm not going to take off points if you misspell things um, in the morphological tree, but just make sure it's clear either way. Uh, the other question that came up with this one is whether or not this could possibly be a noun. So I think normally when we think of the word ship, uh, we think of, you know, a big boat or something like that, uh, a noun of some sort, rather than the, like the process of shipping something overseas. Uh, and that's possible. It's kind of balanced maybe for that particular case. Um, so yeah, you could think that that's possible, but um, then the question comes up, uh, like how does this affix er work in other cases? So uh, I think I, you may recall the Mitch Hedberg examples from the lecture video uh, where we had like a word like blend, um, blend, you could talk about like a blend as a noun, normally it's a verb. So you have like a blender or you could like refrigerate something. 
and then you get a refrigerator, you have to change the spelling there too or something. Most of these other examples are going to be verbs in the root form. I think the best kind of clearest, clearest, less, least ambiguous example would be teach. I don't think there's a teach that you can talk about. There's no noun teach. That's only a verb, but then you can have a teacher on top of that, right? And people were pretty clever in the um, synchronous sessions. So one person came up with like game, uh, like a gamer. Uh, so yeah, I think normally people think of game as a noun. You can, there are some cases where you can use it as a verb, like, you know, you can game the system or something like that. Uh, and I don't know if that's the root of gamer. I think gamer usually comes from just like somebody who plays a lot of video games, right? And that's, that's the noun form. Um, but be that as it may, I would say, think of other examples when you come up with ambiguous cases like this, or you're not sure about what, how to label ship and see if you can find a pattern in other words. Um, and does this correspond to the pattern you see uh, in other words like teacher or blender or maker or some, so on and so forth, right? Um, most of those are gonna be verbs having er added to them to create a noun like in shipper. Okay, um, that's all I'm gonna say about that for now, but we'll see other examples of that process of like kind of looking at other uh, example words to kind of get the same derivation at the end. Um, okay, so let me uh, clean this up a little bit so that I can know exactly where I'm going next. The next one is disobey. So disobey is a verb. And instead of having a prefix, or instead of having an affix, it has a prefix. And the root is obey, which is a verb by itself. You add the affix dis to it, um, and then you get disobey. So you can think of maybe other examples of that as well. We didn't talk about this one in class a whole lot. It wasn't too controversial, but like, um, uh, I can't think of any good ones like disconcert. Uh, yeah, disgust is not a good example. Um, yeah, uh, I'm not actually going to get into that one a whole lot because I can't think of any good examples off the top of my head. I should, but I'm blanking at the moment. So I'll just move on to the next one, which is resettled. So resettled is a verb, uh, but resettled is interesting. So actually, maybe I'll... Dismantle, yeah, every single this one I can think of is a little complicated. So... Uh, resettled has three morphemes in it um so it's got a prefix re um and it's got a suffix d and then it's got this root form settle okay so um i'll give you um, a little tip that something we'll talk about next week in class is that uh, there are two different kinds of affixes in english and in languages throughout the world in general um, some affixes are called derivational affixes like re is one example of them uh, and other affixes are called inflectional, and this D here is another example of that. So this uh, inflectional affix, the D here, um, just kind of forms a past tense of this particular verb. So you can, not, you know, if you settle something, you could, can have settled that thing or something like that, or it was settled, so on and so forth in the past. Um, so this just kind of changes what tense uh, it's in, whether it's past tense, uh, present tense, or future. Um, and resettle, the re, on the other hand, just kind of changes the meaning of the word more fundamentally, right? It's not just did it happen now or previously or will it happen in the future. Um, this is changing the meaning of the verb overall. So you, have, you can settle something once and then you can resettle it again if you want to go back there and do the same thing. Um, so in every single case, if you have a derivational affix like this, re, it's going to attach before the inflectional affix D. So there's a bit of ambiguity here, right? So you could possibly get, at least formally, um, the verb settled first, and you get a structure like that. So this is ultimately, it's gonna be a verb at the top end. Um, we'll have something like that. And so you're not adding, the problem with this is you're not adding re to a specific past tense form of a verb. You're not creating settled and then resettled it that uh, doesn't make any sense, really. Um, you have to create this, you add, or add this derivational affix first. And this tree is getting messy here quickly, but I'll try to fix it up. Um, so you have a verb resettle to begin with, and then you can add the D to it to make just the past tense form of that. So this resettle will have a variety of different forms um, to which you add different inflectional affixes. So like resettled, resettling, um, so on and so forth. Uh, 
you don't add re to each one of those inflectional forms. Instead, you just use the same set of inflectional forms to all normal verbs, um, and it can give you different forms like the past tense or the progressive um, or what have you. Uh, so derivational affixes will always attach first, and that's one way to resolve an ambiguity like we get in a form like we settled. Okay, what's next? Uh, Anticlimaxes, that's a fun one. Um, so let's try to uh, clear up our tree here, to, or at least give us some blanks that we have to fill in. So anti is going to be an affix, it's a prefix. S is another suffix. And our root here is climax. <clears throat> and there's uh, often a little bit of, I guess, fun ambiguity about this word in this class. So uh, anti-climax, uh, so climax is, you know, when something reaches like a peak, right? Um, so you can think of this as a noun. Some people adventurously think of it as a verb. Um, so whether you think of this as a noun or as a verb, uh, changes what this affix at the end is all about. So if this is a noun, then this af uh, this suffix, which is an inflectional suffix, um, is a plural marker, right? So then you have more than one climax. You have climaxes. Uh, if you know you're getting excited and your excitement reaches a peak, then you like he or she climaxes. Uh, okay, so we're just going to go with the noun interpretation of this and the reason why um, is because of this affix here so this is a derivational affix uh, anti and you can talk about something if as if it were an anti-climax like that movie was great but it had an anti-climax so it was kind of disappointing at the end um, so I don't think you can do the same thing with the verb right uh, somebody may be able to climax but can they anti-climax or if you're unsure can you think of um, other examples of uh, anti being used uh, with either verbs or nouns? And again, I think I'm going to blank on this one on the spur of the moment. Uh, this is where it helps to have people involved in class coming up with suggestions. But uh, like, uh, I don't know, anti-tree or something like that. My Christmas tree is sitting right next to me, so I'm thinking about it. Uh, you can be anti a variety of different nouns. Uh, I'm anti-football. I'm anti-tree. Uh, but I don't think you can be anti-verb, right? Uh, like anti-make or something, anti-teach. That just doesn't work. Um, so this anti-climax forms a noun by itself first. That's the original underlying derivation. Uh, and then that's a noun at the top too, which is a plural noun. Uh, so we go from one noun to the next. Okay, so there's a little bit of ambiguity there, but I think we can resolve it fairly easily. There's more ambiguity in number five. Um, Let's try to boil this one down to just three morphemes at the bottom. Because um, usually people kind of want to go one way with this one, even if the evidence points in the other direction. So we have two different affixes here. So our root uh, morpheme is employ, which means to you know give somebody a job, basically. Uh, then we have un, which is derivational affix at the beginning. We have ment at the end, which is another derivational affix. So there's no clue there. Neither one of these is inflectional, so we kind of have to decide by some other fashion which one should attach first. So a lot of people, I'm sorry, this is not a noun, this is a verb. Um, and a lot of people want to make this noun first because employment is a very common noun. Um, and you can think about meant at attaching to other verbs. Uh, kind of an easy example is like government um, or governor is a verb. Uh, I can think of like discern discernment, that sort of thing. Um, it's like, okay, but then what do we do with the un if we have a noun here? So un, uh, if you think of other examples, un is almost always going to attach to a verb. Or in fact, I think in every single case I can think of, it will attach to a verb. So you can think about, um, let's get rid of this and say unmake or undo we get verbs out of that. Un is attaching to a verb and making another verb. Uh, undo is another example in class. We talked about unlock in the lecture. Um, unscrew is another example, so, or so on and so forth. Uh, un can attach to verbs and create another verb like that. Um, 
So you can get unemployed. It's not a very common verb. It's definitely not as common as the word employment, I think. Um, but it's possible and it's pretty easy to understand what it means. It means like you fire somebody basically. Uh, and maybe we don't use unemployed that often because we can just say, well, he got fired um, or whatever. Uh, but otherwise this doesn't work. So meant can attach as an affix to a verb to create a noun and we can get this structure okay, no problem. But then if we try to do it the other way around, we do run into a problem um, and that we're kind of violating the rules of the affixes by saying, well, we create a noun first and then in this one particular exceptional case, we can add un to a noun and get another noun out of it. Um, there's no other word in English that works like that. Um, so I'm not gonna use this notation and I'm gonna go back to the other one I showed you a second ago and say that un attaches to employ and creates a verb and then you attach meant to that to get a noun. And again, uh, if you're uncertain about this, you can always try to think of other examples in English of words that use the same morphemes and create the same patterns and see what sort of lexical categories they attach to and what sort of lexical categories they create at the end of the process. Uh, that's your best bet for trying to figure out the answers to these if you're not sure. Okay, number six is simply, it's a much easier one. We've only got two morphemes to think about there. Uh, let's get rid of this one, yep. Uh, so our root there is simple and we have a suffix for that one we'll call this an adjective we'll notate it like that um, and then we have this affix y uh, and at the top um, we get an adverb so simple is an adjective and in a lot of cases like in the syntax section uh, or chapter and I think maybe in the morphology chapter two this might be notated as just an A but I'm writing it out as adj here just to kind of uh, differentiate it from the adverb which is ADV. Uh, so it's an adjective simple and we saw this I think in class in a few examples you, add, you can add LY or Y to a lot of adjectives and get an adverb out of it. So that's simply. It's a very simple one so I'm not going to say more about it than that. Jumping. Um, is another two morpheme word, so it's not that complex. It's potentially a little bit interesting though. So jump, I think we normally think of jump as a verb. Um, you can take a big jump, I guess, over a chasm or something like that. Uh, but this is the way I'm gonna represent it. So I jump, he is jumping, so on and so forth. That's just another form of the verb. This is actually another inflectional affix. We'll talk about it more uh, in the lectures to come. Uh, but you know, he is jumping, that's, one particular form of the verb to jump. Um, if you've, you know, been a high school English nerd, and you may remember that uh, there's what's called a gerund form of this particular noun or verb jumping. Jumping is fun or something like that. Uh, so there's a little bit of ambiguity there, but it doesn't really change anything. It's just kind of how it's used syntactically in a sentence. So if it's he is jumping, if it's in that sort of frame, it's a verb. So I'm just going to represent it like this. But if it's in the subject slot of a sentence like jumping is dangerous or jumping is fun, then it would be a noun. Um, either way, you just change the top end category for that. Uh, but there's a little bit of ambiguity there. Digitizes. Um, we've got two affixes here. How do we attach them? Um, yeah, so this is pretty simple actually. Um, whenever you add like two affixes on one end of a root, these are both suffixes. Uh, the closest one to the root has to attach first. You can never kind of get crossing lines in your Morphologi uh, morphological tree structures. So um, eyes has to attach to digit first. And it's convenient, eyes is another derivational affix. So digit is a noun, um, like digit is like a number. Uh, but if you digitize something, then you turn it into a series of digits. So that becomes a verb. Uh, and then the S is just a, a form of that verb, right? So um, he digitizes or she dig digitizes, so on and so forth. That's, so that's another verb. Um, but yeah, that's the basic rule anything closer to the root is gonna attach first to the root than something further away. And this is a derivational affix and this is an inflectional affix. So that follows that rule too. Digi uh, derivational affixes have to attach first. Okay, only a couple more to go. These are kind of fun. We've got activity. At least I think they're fun. You can think whatever you want to about them as long as you understand how this works. 
So activity, we've got this thing in the middle here, the root act, put it like that. Um, and then we've got if and itty, hopefully you recognize those morphemes. Uh, and we know based on what I just told you that if is going to attach before itty. Uh, and there's a little bit of um, a question here as to whether or not if is actually something by itself. Um, so some people will often uh, propose that this is just active and then you add itty to it. Um, yeah, so, you know, trying to think of other words um, where you can get itty. Uh, and again, it's hard to do this off the top of my head while I'm still talking. Um, so, you know, like complex, complexity, something like that. <clears throat> so complex is a uh, simple or one morpheme root, and you can add itty to it. Uh, and then you, that's basically the noun, right? So a, complex is an adjective. It's a way to describe something. And then the complexity is just an abstract noun describing the quality of being complex, right? So maybe we have the same thing here with activity uh, where, you know, something is active and then you add itty to it and you get an activity. Uh, but maybe we can boil this down even further and say, well, we've got this verb act and maybe we're adding the affix div to it first. And if we do, we know that um, the if has to attach before the, uh, do I need that? <clears throat> yes, I do. We, the if has to attach before the itty. That part is simple. Uh, the question is whether or not we can think of other examples that follow the same pattern, um, like where act goes to active. Uh, and I think the one of the cases that people came up with in class is like to go from abuse to, uh, or abuse to abusive. Um, I think there may have been others. I'll dig up the little questions that came out here. Um, I think that was the one that was the best example. Uh, yeah, it's it's a bit of a complicated um, morpheme here, this if, because it can kind of change the root a little bit. So like if you have like deceive, um, yeah, I'm actually gonna okay. skip that one. Never mind. Uh, abusive works because abuse goes to abusive. Um, you can't talk about abusivity, so I'm going to go back to the original here and say act uh, activity. So you can boil that one down. It follows the same pattern where it goes from a verb to an adjective when you add div to it. Um, I thought I had a better example, but um, I'm going to skip it now because I can't think of it again. Uh, I guess I shouldn't do these early in the morning. Anyways, that's the way this one looks. Uh, and we've got one more confrontational. Um, and again, the first step in all of these to figure out what are you dealing with at kind of the root. Um, so we've got <clears throat> at least a couple of uh, affixes here, Asian and O. Uh, and then we have confront there at the bottom as the root. So <clears throat> you can confront somebody about something or some other. Uh, and then if you do confront them, then you might have a confrontation. It could get ugly. And if you are the sort of person that does this a lot, then you might be confrontational. Um, yeah, maybe for good or for bad, who knows? Anyways, uh, the confront is a verb and Asian gets added to confront to form a noun. Um, yeah, let me think if I can come up with a uh, good Asian combination. <laughs> yeah, there's one. <laughs> so you can like combine um, and add Asian to it to get combination. So combine is a verb and combination is a noun, so we see a similar pattern there. Um, and I can give you a sort of different one, uh, like exception, exceptional, it's kind of like going from a noun to an adjective with the ol there at the tail end. The question that came up in class is whether the front here is a morpheme by itself. And maybe we've got something going on here um, where we add con to front uh, to form a verb of some sort. Um, that one, even though the mind is not operating at 100% right now, I still don't think even if I was, you know, knew everything, uh, I would ever be able to come up with a um, example of con add, adding to some other like preposition to create a new word. So there's no like con back, you know, con back is not the opposite of confront. Uh, I don't think you can even think of any like con side, right? This is, the, this is not how con works. It looks like this is the word front here, but it's just deceptive, right? Um, it's just a, you know, 
don't want to call it a cranberry morpheme because it's not a morpheme at all. It's just embedded in this entire morpheme confront. Um, so it should look like that in my final tree. Um, yeah. Uh, don't boil that down any further uh, unless you can clearly come up with another example that does the exact same thing to create a verb. Uh, but this one is just confront. Uh, and then it's confrontation, then it's confrontational. And that's your tree. Uh, so again, the goal here is to use the tree structure to not only kind of unpack the hidden structure of the word itself, but also to sort of uh, help us recognize other patterns in the language uh, that are at work. Um, yeah, so freely think of other examples to kind of verify your answers. Uh, and if you can't come up with good ones, then maybe think about changing your answer to something different. Uh, otherwise, that's the 10 uh, answers for this one. Um, I think I'll talk a little bit about uh, Esperanto in another video, but um, I'll say goodbye for now.